thank you everybody. I'm at that time in the afternoon where all of you are thinking either about your bladders or about your flight or about the fact you've been here for a long time. So um, I'm not gonna make this about me or your bladders or hunger or what we're doing tonight, but actually I'm gonna try in, to weave some things into this about your community and where your community stands. And one of the things I, I really like from Star Wars is this quote from Obi-Wan Kenobi. And this is about perspective. That you're gonna find that many of the truths that you believe to be true, that you cling to, depend greatly on our own point of view. In the last 30 years, I've done a lot of work with economic developers, with real estate companies, with manufacturers, with transportation, logistics, all the way across the world. And one of the things I found, without exception, is that most of our leaders that we have voted for, most of our leaders that have got elected and are in positions of authority and trust actually don't generally know much about the communities and the citizens that they represent. When I go to a community, one of the first things I ask is, what's the average unemployment here? What's the average house price? How much on average do people earn per month, per week, per day, per hour? What's the ratio of house price to income? How long does it take somebody in your community to buy the average house? And do you know what most of them say? I don't know. So I pause. They generally pause. We will get a little bit uncomfortable with pauses. And only two have ever said to me, help me figure it out. How do I do that? Why do I do that? And one of the issues is that many of those people can't see the woods from the trees. They have this very tightly focused, one dot view of the world. They're not connecting these dots into something bigger. If we think about economic development, opportunity, labor force data, labor market, all the other things associated with it, what that we learn is these communities all of these places, the education that we're going through, is about building people's skills and their knowledge. We learn things and we understand them, we comprehend them. But that's the bottom of the education and the application paradigm and the pyramid associated with education. All of the people born today will be digital natives before they go to kindergarten. There's not a single child that doesn't know how to unlock a phone and how to use it and what swiping means and how to use their fingers. So one of the embarrassing things about this is that many of the boomers actually afraid of that technology. I was one of those kids that watched the time on the VCR, blink zero, 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 all of the time, because my parents couldn't figure out how to set the time. And they hated me because I used to say, every night when I came home, my mum would say, I was late, do you know what time it is? And I'll say, no, and nor does the VCR. <laughs> and that's a... Well, it's incredibly cheeky to do as a, like a 10-year-old. Um, it's also about this idea of knowledge and knowing and data, right? Because when we think about this pyramid, at the top end, we have wisdom and we have knowledge. That's the very peak of what we're doing. And we have context. So Gray talked about this and Reg talked about this and many other speakers have talked about the importance of context understanding your community. And then below that we have content, not data, but actually information which is provided in such a way that you can apply it. 
You can gain knowledge from it. You can gain understanding. You can see how things compare and contrast, how things correlate. What are the causational things? Those four Cs are what drives improvement. They're the baselines that you need to understand to change the communities in which you live. And below that content level is information. It's slightly better than data, but it's not really that much better. Because what we need to think about is how we start to apply that information directed towards outcomes. We've heard a lot about jobs and, and development, how they change communities. You know, from the presentation about the Dallas Community Colleges to growing a community like San Bernardino. In the discussions about Southwest Indiana and other communities. Because what we need to do is we need to synthesize all of this information and evaluate what it actually means. And you're all data nerds. You all know how to apply that. But that exact theory is, needs to be applied in learning and labor force development. Because we're getting in, in, we're getting in a time and in an era in which all This is uh, on and off. You OK? Do I, shall I use that one? All right. Actually, I will use that one because I'm going to demo. All right. Plan B. All right. So we're getting into a world where all of jobs are going to be hybrid. They're a combination of hard skills and soft skills. They're going to be driven by analytics. And as I said before, you know, we have digital natives. People know how to use digital tools, how to understand information put in front of them. But really what is lacking, and particularly in the middle skills area and in many of the jobs which are being transformed, is the ability to actually interpret and communicate that data and that insight to, to management and to leadership. So how many of you have people that come to, to you and say, this is really important, and they can't explain why? And generally, put your hands up if you have people that <laughs> are the opposite way around, right? I think many of us find they can't understand why. They, they can't communicate. When you ask them to prove something, what are the measures, what are the KPIs, what are the metrics which, which are driving that, to explain why something should be done? And if you're not asking them for KPIs, then you're doing yourself a disservice. I recently was involved in a project at our company, and I told this story earlier in the week. Somebody said that they needed $500 worth of software, and they hadn't been able to get it from there leadership and of course they asked have you done do you put in a request yes I didn't get it so did you actually explain to them the consequence of you not being able to do this and it's like yeah I said I needed it I said well explain the consequence I said what you need to do is to document how many hours per week not having that does on your job how much you were paid per hour and therefore the loss of productivity. That was over a hundred times the cost of the software. So guess what? They got the software, right? But you have small cases like that, that all the time because one of the things that people often fail is to understand business and business context and the importance of this. So the, one of the biggest takeaways for me from this uh, event has been the fact that we're not building the skills that we need in the communities to deliver the jobs which are going to come in the future. So we all worry about jobs being automated and automated away. Companies like Walmart are changing their focus. They're spending $400 million to train people to actually meet the needs of the future. So how many of you have been shopping at Walmart and have met a personal shopper? somebody that in store will actually help you shop around Walmart. Probably not many of you, but there are 35,000 of them. 
online in their acquisitions, they're hiring people with data analytics to compete with Amazon through analysis, but also compete with Amazon and others through personalization. They're changing the workforce so that somebody that's an associate manager in the store not only can use data and analytics to understand the demographics in their trade area, but actually can change the store and the merchandise and have the justification for why that's going to change. And the people that can do that are gonna get promoted. And the pathway to leadership in Walmart is through running those stores. And anybody can participate in this. You don't need to have a formal degree, you can get involved in data analytics. And then the top end of this is this notion of design. Design thinking, designing outcomes, evaluating possibilities, putting things together. So when I think about what most of you do, you're actually designing futures. You're designing opportunities. You're designing a next generation of communities because you're synthesizing all of this information at the bottom. You're applying your knowledge and your expertise and you're creating those possibilities and those prototypes. And what we need to do is to get that sort of thinking much more ubiquitous. We need to get that type of thinking in every single community. When Reg sits down with his futurists and discusses the idea of this seismic shift at the bottom, that's where we need to get to. We won't change it by thin layers at the top, we're gonna do this through systematic and functional change. And to give an example, here's a classic way that we get introduced to cities. Lost Springs, population one, elevation 4,996 feet. Well, it's obviously a lie. It's a lie because there's at least one person taking the photograph and they probably don't live there and they definitely don't live in that house, but that house is at least four feet above the sign. So one of those two things are wrong. And all of our communities have that type of problem. So you drive in and it says, you know, 9,286 people. And I'm like, when? Does nobody die? Is nobody born? Does nobody move in? Do we never change? And then there's other interesting ideas. So a bit of team participation. If in 2015, the median age of a community was 32 in 2015, in 2019, what should it be? Who says 36? Nobody, wow, who says 33? Are you just not playing? <laughs> <laughs> right. Who knows how to answer that question? Sorry? Sorry. Well, yeah, so the, so the comment was, do you need inf more information? The answer is yes, you need in more information. But many people assume that because four years ago the median age was 32, everybody's going to age to be 36 in four years' time. And you see that all, all of the time. But communities that where it's consistent and not changing are really incredible dynamic communities. That's a bit of a paradox, right? Because you have people that leave, people that come in, and people that, that constantly change. But at the same time, you see communities which are aging. Communities where people are aging in place. Communities where the young people are leaving. And those types of fundamental changes where you've got a three to four year change in the median age in three to four years should be signs on the road that something's happening in those communities to the dynamism of those communities. What I spend my time on is, is trying to provide more information to help people understand these things. So they bring these sort of infographics to bear that tried to bring lots and lots of points of data and pieces of information together contextually. And we're gonna do some of this work and we're gonna see some of these things. 
So we can think about here, not just how much does your home cost and how much do you earn, but actually mortgage as a percent of salary. And look at this community. We've got 12% who are servicing their mortgage by more than 50% than of their salary. Home values are 250,000 in, in many of these cases. So we can think about you know, these dynamics. What does that mean? Who are the people that are rent disadvantaged? Who have low disposable income? How long would it take to take these two pieces of information and buy a home? And if all you're doing is servicing 50% of your income to buy your home, what are you not doing in terms of the quality of life? And what do we need to do to change communities so that we can improve the quality of life? In this sort of community, one of the things we could do is actually create houses which are more affordable. We could create jobs which give them a better wage level. We could float all of the boats by actually increasing disposable income and generating tax dollars in the community. And inside this are some stories. We have these gaps in this profile when we compare this track to Tennessee. And we can do this across lots of different ways. So we can compare communities because we can contextualize this. So this is a, a benchmark demographic report that a lot of real estate companies use. And it's comparing generational information in a trade area, 5, 10, 15 minute trade area. And for anybody that's um, is it one of those administrators? Here's a summary where you can instantaneously get information about the country, right? So how many households earn less than $15,000 per year? And you can see the variations in this community. So California has 4.5% more people earning 200,000 and above than the United States. That's a great number, California apart from the fact it doesn't mean anything. It's just a data point. Because if you have a home that costs $600,000, or you live in San Francisco County, where the median house price is 1.2 million, earning $200,000 or more doesn't help you. So the idea of data is to provide context so things like community op opportunity profiles to be able to do these comparisons and index them against things like the state and other places. And we can go and do this anywhere. So I want you to come on a little journey with me as we actually do some, some of this analysis and you get to, to participate too in this. So this is a, a standardized uh, report, an infographic that that we can use. It's completely interactive and it's an output from one of our software products called Business Analyst. And what we're doing with Chimera is working on much tighter integration between many of you who are ArcGIS users and users of Jobs EQ. So be able to take the data and bring it into the system and make it much more tightly integrated so things like the shape files that you use, to be able to show you where to go and get those shape files, to use the Esri's tool so you can bring those into, into the system. So this example here allows me to zoom in and look at a, a lot of different pieces of data. So the home value, the medium household income, mortgages, a percent of salary, all the other things we just, we just looked at. The year the house is built. So in this community here, one of the challenges is around my headquarters is we've got no space to build. So the last houses were pretty much built in 1989. Many of those houses were built in 1939 and before. So what does that mean? Many of those houses are not in the sort of condition that people expect today. Many of those houses are occupied by white collar workers and single wor uh, service workers. Um, not many of them use public transport. We're trying to hire 
almost a thousand people at our company. The E in ESRI or ESRI stands for environmental. So one of the things that the um, San Bernardino and Riverside County in our area has done is actually reinvigorate a railway. So we're gonna have a railway that passes within 100 feet of our offices. And that is gonna give us access to a massive talent pool in East LA, which currently are driving west between 60 and 90 minutes to go and work in LA. We can get them not only to come east to us, but we can get them to do it on public transport. So it's sustainable, it's profitable for us, and it's good for all of those people. And we can take all these reports and compare them, so I can do a 10 and a 15 minute comparison in my drive time. This has been completely detached from the software, so this is something that you can embed on your website, an interactive report. No software involved, purely done in HTML, and I can now generate these types of comparisons so I can see how all these different factors compare. And I can take, for example, my workforce profile, in this case I'm benchmarking five minutes, and see how the jobs change within 10 and 15 minutes in this community. So let's go and do some of this live, right? So here are those drive times. I can click on infographics and start to understand how they how this community is reflected in the data and the ages. So everything that we've just, we've just looked at. I could compare California or the United States. I can start to filter this by saying, well, I only want certain conditions. So now I can pick the top five in terms of the commute times and, and how those vary. I can look at other things like jobs and other um, areas that I'm interested in. We can take these as essentially PowerPoint templates and share them. So Robin from Tampa um, became a, a user this year and um, she and I email backwards and forwards these types of report and customize them for her local community. So here's a, an example of working in an area, right? I've taken those drive times and I've looked at jobs. And somebody come along and say, tell me the communities with more than 5,000 millennials. Tell me the places that meet this criteria. And one of the things that we can do is we can take this information and just start adding communities, zip codes in this case, onto our map or highlighting them. But that doesn't really work. One of the things we want to do is to use dashboards and information to contextualize. So I can start to filter all of this. So one of the things I might want to do is to say, well, let's look at all the manufacturing jobs where they represent 4.5 or more percent of the area. So this is great, right? So in our community, 5, 10, 15 minutes, we all meet those. But what other zip codes fill in, fit in this? Well, there's a really smaller set than there were before. But what if I change that further by saying, I also want IT jobs, and I'm gonna pick some of these. And what you see very quickly as I filter these, uh, five, 10, 15 minute drive times, they disappear. So I know, and I can compare this site to other places. I can actually do targeting. So those, um, drive times don't meet that criteria, but there's a bunch of zip codes that do. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna add them onto my map and make them a contiguous set of geographies. And we can just go around and, and add these. And so the nice thing is for the community that I live in, those types of jobs and those types of skills are actually available to the people that live there. The challenge for me in my community is many of the elected officials and the people involved in economic development don't know this. So people in my community commute 30, 40, 90 minutes 
to job somewhere else. So one of the things that we've been challenging leadership in, in communities is to not bring people to jobs, but actually bring jobs to people. And that's essentially one of the incredible, powerful things in Jobs EQ, is to identify what those gaps and where they might be. And we can think about this in other ways, doing comparisons. So I can take all this information for some work that we did recently in, in New York. Um, quite bizarrely, there are opportunity zones in Manhattan because when you take the actual daytime demographics of Manhattan, it qualifies as an opportunity zone because of income, housing affordability, jobs, and all these other factors. Because one of the issues with Manhattan is that many of the people that live there can't actually afford to work there or live there without some type of um, subsidy. And we've moved further with this in, in many, many different ways. So creating the idea that completely free, completely open data, that you can take topics that you care about and curate information. So if we're interested in things like economic opportunity, communities are sharing things like jobs, maps and data sets openly about these different types of topics. So if we look at, for example, this, this one map about the relationship between driving alone and rurality, this is information that comes from um, government sources, and we can just pick this data set up and start exploring it. You don't have to be an Esri software user. These are all completely open to you. You can take this data, you can copy it, you can do a whole range of different things with it. And what are we seeing from this? We're seeing communities with a, where in blue, a high proport percent of workers, they drive alone and they live in rural areas. That's not a map of population. That's actually a map of people which are disadvantaged by jobs. This is a map of, of opportunity to create new forms of working, telecommuting, analytics, the modern hard and soft skills that we need. And one of the challenges is that many of these communities, you, you have this absolute wrong side of the track idea. There are communities where you've got incredible skills in the, you know, pe they're rural communities, but people don't drive alone, they telecommute, and other places where you've got a concentration so you've got jobs and they don't drive alone, don't have to go very far. So one of the, so you'll see that often they're in um, urban areas, highly urban and concentrated locations. So we can start to inform ourselves with this type of information. We can go further associated with this type of work. So beyond this sort of static view of New York or this interactive view, how did I get there? We can start to think about how do we model for the future and model analytics and these comparisons. So in this example, one of the things we're doing is we're taking a bunch of factors and economic indicators and we're moving the sliders up and down to see what areas match a criteria. And we can do exactly the same thing live. So we can go into this page and start to say, well, tell me more about New York in this example. So here's our population, and I can move this slider around to now start to see where are the highly populated areas, and where are the areas with a high number of families, this condition. I can zoom in and start to see those, but not only can I individually explore data sets, but I can say, tell me all the communities which are similar, so I can randomly click on a location and see somewhere which is like somewhere else. So this immediately starts to tell me that there are 18 out of 1,100 census tracts with similar characteristics. But in this case, there's only three. And over here, there's another number, it's 14. 
And we can use this for targeting, and we can use this for analysis, and we use this for understanding. But most importantly, we can use this for designing. We can use this for thinking about what does this future look like? So one of the big challenges for many of you is to compare yourselves to somewhere else, to compare yourself to the future that you could create, to compare yourself to what you want to be going forward compared to who people think you are from the past. And that's one of the biggest challenges about stories. So think about Star Wars. So Star Wars is, for many people, the greatest story ever told. Now, I don't necessarily agree with that. It's a really interesting story about good and evil, about light and dark. But inside it is also a story about discovery and information and things that you know and consequences and change. And that moment between Luke and Darth Vader that everybody remembers is sort of like when you go and tell somebody what's really inside their data. And you have that moment where you sort of realize that you have this connection that you don't really want to have. That you've got somebody who for the entire movie is being presented as dark and somebody's presenting light and it's much more complicated and much more threaded and much more entangled than you ever thought it would be and that's where a lot of data is and a lot of data problems are associated with this but we can make it simple we can do things like this where we generate those comparisons so i can use these lego men to communicate What's the predominant population? Is it daytime population of people coming into work, or is it nighttime population? So I immediately get a sense of what New York actually looks like. I can understand what every census tract looks like, and I can start to communicate with people in tools and dashboards and information products that make sense to them. Not lots of tables, not lots of Excel information and pages and pages of, of data, but actually something that just does comparisons. A versus B, this is bigger, how much bigger is it? Where does, where does this fit? So what I wanted to do was also show you some of the um, data that uh, John shared with me last night. So here's a classic out output, um, some of the training has been taking shapefiles. And so all this shapefile contains is something that came out of Jobs EQ. It's got the NAICS code, um, employment, wages, and total employment. And what I want to do is just like Star Wars, is I want to bring out the story inside this data. So what I'm going to do with this data is start to pick one of the topics, so you guys get to choose average wages, employment, or employment total. Average wages, oh, good one. All right, so now we can just play it in many, many different ways. So classically, this is the way that almost everything is, is displayed with um, a set of breaks. But at Esri, one of the things that we don't do is we don't encourage people to categorize data into blocks or to use natural breaks and those types of things. Because what that tends to do is to hide the information inside the data. So you can see here that this data is highly skewed and concentrated. And we're using a high to low. And what I can do is start to stretch this. And the data itself will tell its own story. Or I can move the bottom up. So now I can start to see what are my extremes, what's in the middle, where are those outliers. And we've built a set of data discovery tools that allow you to do this automatically. So now what I'm doing is doing above and below operation. And somebody might have come in and said, well, you know, average wages, good average wages are. So what's the US average salary? 
Anybody know? It was on one of my slides. <laughs> Approximately 55, it's about 62, all right? So close, all right? So, there, so let's do this. So this is using, um, you know, uh, an index. So now I can take this and start to, start to stretch it. So now I could say, well, 62,000. And maybe here we want to say all of the people that are at 40,000, right? Or we could round this to, to 60,000 just to make it simple and bring this one in to something like 100,000. So by sliding this up and down and manipulating these areas, what you see is these categories which are outliers. But we can do lots of statistical analysis. So I can turn this around and say, well, actually, what I really want to do is I could use natural breaks, right? And they come up with some really interesting categories. And the problem with natural breaks or janks um, is that is, but as you move between communities and locations, those values and those categories change. So one of the things that we like to encourage people to do is use things like quantile, so categorize them into, say, four equal bucket. But much better is to use standard deviation. So the idea of this is that I can then say, well, what's average, what's above average, what's below average? And I can do this in one standard deviation or half standard deviation. So now I've got these nine plus categories. And we can really see those in the darkest blue, which are the highest in terms of average wage, not just in terms of absolute numbers, but in terms of comparisons. So I could run this analysis on every single community that JobsEQ has and, and be able to compare every single one against these metrics. So some of these areas, on average, have eight times the income. And some of those are actually sat at one and a half times less. So that's an interesting idea that you've got this basically almost 10 half standard deviations between them. So you've got really, really wealthy communities. So we can take something like that and we can perform other forms of analysis. So we can take this and say, well, what I want to do is start looking at hotspot analysis. So where are the areas where that high income is concentrated? And surprise, surprise, it's within Washington, D.C. But there are spots that stand out as hot spots, so around Reston. But there's all these cold spots which exist. So these are places where the income is lower than you would expect based on the nation, the um, neighbors associated with them. And we can take it in similar ways and start to look at hot spots and cold spots and um, outliers. So one of the things that we start to see is to understand how those individual areas are behaving. So within this cold spot, we actually have a hot spot. So there's a group of people living in a community where the incomes are far higher than you would expect associated with its neighbors. But if we zoom into DC itself, one of the things we start to see is the fact that we've got Again, this idea of the wrong side of the tracks, the wrong zip code, the wrong, wrong census track. So you've got places which are islands where they're um, low high outliers. So around them are, are a set of um, high income areas, high wage areas, and inside are, are low points. So these are things which you can use to direct policy and opportunity. You can turn data into something more than just visual representations. Start to do more with all of these different, these different things. And these policy information, these policy maps, the idea is to, that you can curate them up and start to, to look at other, other factors. So in this case, we can, you know, we look to the distribution of, um, of county level information, I can take something like this and start to combine it. So now 
let's look at some of the factors which might explain this. So in this case, it's location affordability, which is a, an index. And this data set explains the housing and transportation costs. And we can start to see the degree to which these two data sets overlay and combine. We can do this visually and we can do this analytically. And we can start to understand more about these data sets, right? Where did it come from? Who created it? Why did they create it? Who's part of it? So this type of information is absolutely key because we can understand the different profiles of the, of the houses associated with this. So this data comes from HUD. There's a reference to it. You can go and download it if you want, or you can get access to it through the open, the open data set. And all of this is then supported with storytelling. So I can take this type of information and I can bring it into a system that I can communicate with this. Esri is really proud to actually participate and support Amazon HQ amongst our communities. Of the 100 people that were considered in the last 100, every single one of them used a story map to communicate internally or externally to Amazon the opportunities of their, commu of their community. And these story maps are a way of collecting information and building representations and way of, of communicating different information. So these are the things that we can build together out of Jobs EQ. These are ways that we can communicate different issues and different foundational parts of, of data. And finally, what I want to do is talk about the fact that you know, this quote, I see a lot being a data nerd, right? Without data, you're just another pin person with an opinion. And I'm going to apologize for my European language, but opinions are like our souls. Everyone's got one. And part of the issue is that with data, it's just data, right? You can construct data in any way that you want to tell the story that, um, that you need to. But people that you work for and work with and the people that you serve are actually expecting you to deliver action and outcomes associated with that information. It's not about data, it's about giving them guidance and direction. So in my best Obi-Wan Kenobi, one of the things that I learn as a young person, one of my mentors said to me, there are no decisions without data, but there's no success without synthesis. That you need to understand how to take that data, to aggregate it, to apply it, to analyze it, to contextualize it, and then use it with the knowledge and the wisdom that you have gained and synthesize that into action. And so everything that you ever see about Luke using the force, from the voices in his head to those amazing moments with the lightsaber, is actually the synthesis of everything that he's learned. So my guidance to you is to continue to use the force to synthesize that and deliver success. Thank you.